all the loud ones are the ones who've been at Fusion or in our leadership team. They know Ben. He's awesome. And uh, tonight's Ben's very first time ever speaking to you guys, which is kind of scary because some of you guys are oh no, funny looking and stuff like that. But uh, I believe, in fact I know, that Ben's got something special to share with us tonight. So I'm going to pray for him and I'm going to get off the stage so that God can just speak for Ben. So let me pray for Ben, let me pray for you guys. And then we're going to get into it this evening. Let's pray together. Hey, Father, I just thank you that uh, you've given us this ministry. You've given us the opportunity to come together, to dance together, to play volleyball, hand to, to to head up to the land zone and all the rest of it. But, Lord, we just thank you most of all that right now we have the opportunity to sit and to listen to what you're saying to us. Father, I just ask as Ben speaks that you would uh, give him clarity of thoughts, that you would uh, use him tonight to convey a message to the young people in this group here, so they may learn something new about you, so they may experience you in a different way, so they may leave this place changed by you. Lord, we know that you reign, we know that you are the ultimate connection. May tonight just reaffirm that, may you use Ben, may you protect him, may you guide him. In your mighty name I pray, Amen. Amen. Hey, huge round of applause for Ben, and then we get into it. Well, yes, uh, my name is Ben. For those of you who didn't know, we'll pick up from what Nick was saying. And uh, you might have a little bit from there. I don't know if you can see from there. I've got a little bit of fuzz growing here. I'm starting to grow a winter beard. Who likes beards? Yeah, a couple of people. Who doesn't like beards? That's fine. I will forgive you for that. Uh, but I was talking with Nick last night in the car park, and uh, he was standing there. And he was outside his car, and he's got jackets on, and he's shivering away. And he's like, Ben, why are you shivering? Beards. They keep you warm. So uh, I'm growing a beard to keep warm, but it's not the only reason I'm growing a beard. The other reason is Jet and I looked at each other a couple of weeks ago and went, let's grow a beard. So we're having a beard off. And I was telling one of the other interns about this beard off going on, and without missing a beat, they just looked at me and said, Jet's going to win. <laughs> right, thanks. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Holly. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it's all right. Buddy. But yeah, so thankfully, it doesn't really matter to me whether I grow a better beard than Jet or not, because... My identity is not wrapped up in whether or not I have an awesome beard, which at the moment it's pretty scraggly, let's admit it. It's not got that great at the moment. Give it a couple of months and it will be amazing, assuming it makes it that far. But tonight I want to do ask you, where does your identity lie? What is your identity? What is it that makes you go, that's me? What, what is it that gives you definition in your life? What do you find gives you value? And uh, it's something that we all have. We all find our identity in something, whether we recognize it or not. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about that tonight. Who here's seen the TV show The Big Bang Theory? A few people. It's a, it's a TV show that's on repeat all the time on Channel 9. Uh, if you've never seen it, you're probably living under a rock or you're trying to avoid it. But uh, on The Big Bang Theory, I live in a house with three other guys. And uh, we all like watching it. We watch, hang out for it every week when it's on. Uh, we sit down together, we, uh, we watch it together, we laugh. Often, we're all from a science background or an engineering background, so we often get a lot of those jokes that they're talking about between Sheldon and Leonard and all the others. But just in case you haven't seen it, it revolves mostly around these characters of Sheldon and Leonard. They live together, they're nerdy geniuses, and uh, they live next door to this girl called Penny. She's a blonde, she works at the Cheesecake Factory, and compared to these two guys, she's a normal person. And uh, so they don't really understand normal life, and she doesn't understand science life. You put them all together in one show, and hilarity happens. It's amazing. Um, and they just all laugh at what happens to each other. But uh, Sheldon, in particular, is a really, really smart guy who borders on obsessive compulsion about everything being just right. Like, he, he has everything lined up. All his cereals are lined up in accordance with fiber content. He uh, has a schedule for when he goes to the loo. Could you imagine, like, every day you go, oh, it's four past nine, I better go to the loo right now. This is what Sheldon's life is like. He is always right on time. Everything is perfect, to the letter, on schedule, everything's in its place. And for Sheldon, if something goes wrong, if something's not quite right, he starts to freak out. And uh, I think the, the easiest way to explain this would be, like, uh, one of his main hobby horses is he has a couch in his house, and one part of that couch is his spot. The end is his spot. And don't you ever dare try and sit in Sheldon's spot. It's uh, his spot, and if you sit there, bad news. It's kind of not going to be good. How about I show you a clip or something where this happened to Sheldon? So Sheldon, he uh, saw his seat was taken, and he just did not know what to do. Didn't know what to do. He loves his organization and his routine life. He just absolutely loves it. He believes he's so smart he can solve any problem there is, especially if it's a maths or a science problem. 
And uh, his life just makes so much sense to him when everything is in order, when everything is just the way it's supposed to be. And uh, it's, it's what he draws his self-worth from. It's the way he says, hey, I am Sheldon when everything is right, when everything is in the right place. And uh, it's his whole reason for existing. Now, if something happens to that, Sheldon turns into a mess. If his organization is messed up, if his routine is interfered with, he just feels violated. Or if someone comes along who appears to maybe be smarter than him, Sheldon will go to any length to prove how much smarter he is. Uh, he's, he's got a few little problems there. He, he, he'll sometimes break down or go crazy. One time, he couldn't solve this problem, and, and he went so far into the deep end of being nuts that he ended up swimming in a pool of, of those, you know, those little balls in a ball pit? And that's, that's where that bazinga line comes from. He's swimming in the ball pit, and pop up and go, bazinga! And uh, they couldn't find him because he kept hiding in it. Anyway, that was a funny episode. But uh, what makes Sheldon feel like he's Sheldon when it's played with? His life just falls into a crumble. And we see this in the show many times, it's actually a source of their humour, like sometimes, like that episode, someone will sit in this spot and then he'll freak out, or someone will put two things in opposite post, uh, spots or positions and he'll freak out. And it's just something that goes wrong with him. In one episode, it was time for Sheldon to get his hair cut. Now, Sheldon finds himself in such a routine that he would get the same haircut on the same day of every month from the same hairdresser. And there's one day he goes in to get his hair cut, and his hairdresser is in hospital. And uh, so he's like, oh, I can't get my hair cut today. And that starts to worry him. So he sits down and gets a substitute hairdresser to try to do his hair cut, but it's just so uncomfortable for him. He gets up and runs out of the, the hairdressing salon. And uh, it just sends him on this wild downward slope of going, if my life is not running according to my routine, what's going on? What, what choice do I have but to just descend into chaos? Let's look at this sort of clip and see what happens to him. If you haven't seen the rest of that episode, he just descends into further chaos, ends up playing bongos at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I won't spoil the rest of it if you want to watch it. So I want to ask you the question tonight. We've seen Sheldon, he, he's defined by his routine and his normality, or what's normal to him. Um, but what is it that defines you? What is it that makes you tick on the inside? What is it that is so important to you that it makes you say, this is who I am? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have in life that can define us, but... For, for me, uh, I want to say it up front, my identity is mostly found in God and what God thinks of me. Uh, I've been through several periods in my life where it could have been absolutely anything. There were other things that I found my identity in. When those fell apart, I was a bit like Sheldon. I, I hit rock bottom and I was like, what point is there in doing anything here in life anymore? But then realized what my identity was in God and my whole life turned around. You see, our, our theme for this term has been the ultimate connection. And as we've heard over the other weeks of all the other preachers, this ultimate connection is our relationship with God. And uh, that connection that I have with God in it, I know that God loves me and that He would do anything for that connection to exist between us. So it's something that He actually did 2,000 years ago when He sent His Son to die on the cross for my sin. And what that means is my sin, the things that I do wrong that God's not happy with, they get in between me and God. They, they disrupt that connection. But God was so desperate for that connection to happen that He did something about it for me. And He made the connection happen by, by getting His Son to pay the price for my sins so it could be done away with. And in this connection I have with God, there's, there's nothing that could endanger it from falling apart. Nothing here on earth could ever make it go away. God's always the same. God doesn't fail. And uh, He will always be there for me. That connection is going to last. But even when we are Christians, like, like I said I was a while ago, we can easily fall into the trap of believing the lie that what others say about us defines us. I just want to put that out there again. It's a lie when what others say about us defines us. If you remember that movie, Batman Begins, one of the key themes was Batman searching for his own identity as he was forming himself into Batman. And there was that quote, that was in a deep voice, he said it often like, It's not one underneath that matters, but what I do that defines me. I'm a terrible Batman impersonation. Thank you for clapping. I, I do feel better about that. But, um, oh, that's cool. it was fun to Thank you. But, but the thing there, even with Batman, it's thinking that it's what he does that matters. Even then, he was seeking approval from other people to define who he was. And uh, I know you guys aren't Batman because I'm Batman. But um, even in your own lives, there's the stuff that we can fall into. Maybe it's uh, you feel like you're too short and your life would only be meaningful if you were tall. Or, or maybe your life would only be meaningful if you could get that right jumper so that you look like everyone else. Or maybe, maybe you're brilliant on the sports field 
and you're always picked first for, for sports and um, you know that when people appreciate you for all your sporting achievements, that that's what makes you feel like you. And if maybe that fell away, your life might feel meaningless. But these are examples of, of finding identity in things that are not God. Maybe you're one of those people who's always in a relationship. You may be never single for too long if a relationship breaks off because you just can't find yourself in a place where being single is worth anything. Again, this is where we're finding our identity in all the wrong places. When those things break down, we feel so unworthy and feel devalued. But I want to tell you that while it's good, it's good to be good at sports, it's good to be good at music, it's good to be in a relationship with a long-time partner and you're going to marry them. Um, it's good to have these things, but when we find that our life is defined by them, that's when we've got an issue. These things are supposed to be extras on top of what, what we believe when, when uh, we see our identity in God. See, the reality is anything we find on earth is never going to last. It's always going to fail us. And if we find our identity in the stuff here on earth, it's not going to last. So let's just ask the question, what does it look like if my identity is in God? What that means is we start seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. If you look in Romans chapter 8, it talks about us being God's children, that we are children of God. And, and that sort of connotation just starts bringing up the idea that that God has our backs, that God is the most loving Father there ever was. He loves us so much, any more, way more than any earthly father could. And He showed that love to us. In Romans 5, it even says, before we, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God loves us now just the way we are. He doesn't wait for us to get perfect. He doesn't wait for us to get rid of our sin. You know, like in movies, when there's that nerdy girl with the glasses and her hair up and everyone avoids her and... As soon as she takes the glasses off and lets her hair fall down and does that little flip of her hair thing, and all of a sudden she's beautiful and all the guys flock to her, it's not like that at all. God sees you when you still got the glasses on, so to speak. God loves you exactly the way you are. He values you um, before you've even noticed Him. You know, you are His prized artwork, His creation. He made the universe and the humanity was His prized part of it. There's a book in the Old Testament called Psalms, and in there is a whole collection of songs and poems written about God, and one of my favorites is Psalm 139. And the reason it's my favorite is it goes through and tells us how much God loves us, how much He values us. And it says in there, God knew us before we were even born. While we were still forming in our mother's womb, God knew us. He could see us. It also says God has seen everything that's ever happened to us. He's seen our high points, our low points, our successes, our failures, every mistake we've made. Yet He still loves us and still values us. It's an encouraging psalm. I recommend if you've got a Bible at home or on your smartphone to, to look it up and have a read of it later tonight and just realize how much God loves you. That's not the only bits in the Bible. There's plenty of And when we start seeing that, we start seeing that our identity as God sees us, that we are loved and valued the way we are. We don't need to be defined by our feelings, or defined by what others think of us. You're not defined by how popular you are, or what car you drive, or who you hang out with, or what clothes you wear, or how good a beard you can grow, or what colour your shoes are. God values you the way you are. He identifies you as His own. The thing is, if you don't know who you are in God, then you're open and vulnerable to that lie of what others think about you. But the concrete, solid truth is that you are a valued child of God, and He loves you and wants to have that ultimate connection with you. And He wants to invite you into that relationship with you. You know, tonight, if, if you want to talk about that, or you want to find out what it means to have your identity in God, or find out how to become a Christian, or to pray, or to say anything, uh, I'm going to hang down the front afterwards tonight, and you're more than welcome to come and grab me and talk to me. Or you can even grab me, or you can grab an intern, or another senior leader, they'll all be happy to talk to you about it. But I'm going to invite the MCs up, I'm going to pray, and we're going to close up and we're going to go home. But I want you to remember that to put your identity in God because He's the one who loves you so much. He values you so much. And He wants that ultimate connection with you in that relationship. Let's pray. Look, God, I want to thank you for every person here in this building, whether their eyes are closed or open or listening or talking. God, thank you that you love each of us the same, whatever we're at, whatever we've done. God, I pray that for each person here, you would reveal to us that how much you do love us, Lord, that you remind us of it, Lord, that we'd grab hold of that truth, and God, that you would form that ultimate connection with us to that relationship with you. In Jesus' name.
Amen.